Good morning uh, in the room and online. I'm really delighted to be uh, uh, again uh, in Geneva and with you all uh, for this briefing organized by the Geneva Environment Network. Uh, thanks, Diana and the team. Thanks also to the Swiss uh, uh, Confederation for the support given to the Geneva Environment Network, which is really the voice of the environment in international Geneva and, and bringing it here but also to the world as we are on a hybrid session and uh, to, to, to debrief you about the results of UNEA 5, which took place um, four or five weeks ago now. I didn't count the days, but because we are already in a new negotiation now in Geneva with the CBD, it never stops, but it's really uh, 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 for, uh, important for multilateralism uh, that, we, that we have this negotiation. So, so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here for this session. Uh, I am uh, together with colleagues. I won't do the introductions. I think colleagues, you will uh, introduce yourselves as, you, as we speak. We've got a few colleagues online as well. But uh, I want to uh, start, and you've got the list of speakers now on the screen. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, my name is Bruno Pozzi, for those who don't know me, and I'm the director uh, for UN Environment uh, Programme in Europe, based here in Geneva. So let me start with, with the briefing uh, on the generalities, if I could say, but very important generalities about UNEA 5.2. So UNEA 5.2 uh, uh, took place end of February, beginning of March. Uh, it was an intensive week preceded by a, a week of, of intense negotiation in the open-ended CPR, uh, 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 and it gathered more than 3,000 participants, uh, 1,500 online, and many, many, many on site. It was actually an incredible moment for many of us, because for two years we had not seen each other physically, and, and it was an important uh, moment to, to be together, to be the voice of the environment, and to negotiate uh, a number of resolutions, we're going to come to this. 175 member states participated. That's nearly, I think that's the highest number we ever had in a UN Environment Assembly. 79 ministers, either physically or online, and 17 high-level officials uh, were uh, in the negotiations. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, these negotiations were very successful indeed because 14 resolutions were adopted. Uh, they were initially on more resolutions than that, but some in the process were uh, put together, and we ended with 14 of them uh, that were adopted with very important decisions and a, a, a strong ministerial declaration. Let me go to the resolutions, because this is really what, what uh, 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 matters in a UNEA. This is the world coming together to uh, create resolutions to negotiate them and adopt them and, and change the way we address the environment globally. And these resolutions, these 14 resolutions in the process, and I think it's important to underline it, uh, we had clustered them uh, in five different uh, 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 pillars, uh, plastic pollution, nature and biodiversity, chemicals, waste and pollution, the green recovery and circular economy, and then a last one on organizational and administrative matters. But if you see the clusters, if you uh, uh, read the simple words that are there, these are all the priorities of the triple planetary crisis. So actually, uh, uh, it was uh, an important thing to cluster them like that, and it facilitated the negotiation process. And uh, let me go then cluster by cluster. And I will underline in each cluster one important decision. And cluster one is, uh, and it's, there's a reason why you call it cluster one, actually, uh, is the one that dealt with uh, uh, plastic uh, pollution and adopted a groundbreaking resolution to end plastic pollution uh, to start a process to set up an internationally, uh, an international legally binding instrument uh, to end this uh, pollution. We know how difficult it is to tackle that kind of pollution, how uh, 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 holistic uh, 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 it has to be, uh, it has to look at the whole life cycle of, of plastic from production to, uh, to the end of life of, of the product, uh, 
but uh, it is also a necessity to have this uh, legally binding instrument. And basically, this resolution was adopted unanimously after very long hours of negotiations, very strong engagement by all uh, uh, countries, uh, member states, stakeholders, uh, to get there and giving a strong mandate to UNEP to lead this work, asking our executive director to convene an international uh, negotiating committee that is going to start its work now in the second half of 2022 with the ambition, and it is a complex ambition, but it has to be the ambition that drives us, of completing the work by the end of 2024. Uh, if we manage this, if the INC goes to a, a, a solution, we will have uh, an internationally uh, legally binding instrument to tackle plastic pollution, including in the marine environment, and it could include both binding and voluntary approaches. But it will have a comprehensive approach, really, uh, on the full life cycle of plastic. So this is really, I think, a, a historic moment. Uh, there were cheers, clapping, uh, like in a concert hall, <laughs> that I've never seen that in a UN meeting. I think we are all uh, 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 with high emotions, uh, not only because we had worked so many hours, but also because we knew history was made in Nairobi as the gavel went down on that resolution. So uh, let us congratulate the world once again for uh, taking this historical decision. The second cluster was on nature and biodiversity. And there, four resolutions were negotiated and adopted uh, unanimously. Uh, uh, you can see uh, on lake management, so uh, on nature-based solution, uh, actually creating for the first time a definition uh, that is unanimously uh, 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 understood and accepted by the United Nations. And uh, I know, of course, nature-based solutions have been discussed a lot, notably in Geneva and in Europe. Uh, but it was very important to have it as, there, as well now in a UN uh, uh, context. And with this, we can work strongly on uh, continuing the work on, on, on how to use this nature-based solution to tackle the triple planetary crisis. Resolution on animal welfare, on biodiversity and health. Some links could be made with the CBD processes. I won't make them now, but uh, you can see there uh, good work was achieved. Uh, the, the third cluster was on chemical waste and pollution. And I was talking about groundbreaking moment. Uh, I think that was the second very important moment of this uh, UNEA, uh, the adoption uh, of a resolution that sets uh, in motion a science policy panel to contribute to the sound management of chemicals and waste and to prevent pollution. Uh, you know, three, three crises. One is a as, as is climate change, there's the IPCC, one is biodiversity, is there's IPES, well, chemical waste pollution was missing one, and now we have uh, the possibility to address that and to set it up, and again, a very strong mandate to UNEP, work is starting, uh, I know the team is being put in place, and, and the ambition is really, really high, but I think colleagues also here will, will, will come with some comments on this, and then also, uh, 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 a resolution on the sound uh, management of chemicals and waste, uh, which is uh, also extremely important as we move uh, forward. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I think, are, are again very groundbreaking moments, and, and we can again there say well done to multilateralism. The fourth uh, cluster dealt with uh, the green recovery, we still in the post-pandemic time on the promotion of circular economy. You can see a resolution on resilient infrastructure and sustainable infrastructure, very important. We know that the infrastructure are going to triple in the next 50 years. Uh, we, we will need more infrastructure, and if you don't build them sustainably, uh, we will miss all our targets. Uh, uh, and, and basically then uh, resolutions on uh, the uh, post-COVID-19 recovery on uh, the promotion of circular circularity to achieve sustainable consumption and production, and a very interesting one as well on the, the environmental aspects, the governance of minerals and uh, metals management, uh, and everything is linked, I would say, there. Uh, if you don't have sustainable infrastructure, if you don't have 
uh, sustainable uh, use of uh, and minerals and 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 and, uh, and uh, natural resources. And if you don't bring circularity well, uh, then we will uh, also miss uh, our targets. And then cluster five, which looked more at uh, organization and administrative matters. Uh, there was one resolution on geographical distribution of staff in UNEP. You know, we are an international organization, so we need to reflect uh, the diversity uh, or, and, uh, and, uh, or, or, of our membership. And I think it was important to, to uh, have it uh, uh, agreed upon again by all member states. And uh, also an important resolution on the future of the global environment outlook, which, you know, is, is, is a, it looks like a telephone book, but it's a very interesting telephone book far more interesting to read than, 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 than the telephone book because it has everything, the geo, that you need to know about uh, the state of the environment and where we're going. And so member states have agreed that we will continue with this work, that we will uh, come with the science, with the data and with the analysis that UNEP is uniquely placed in the UN system to uh, bring forward. So this, this is an important also decision that was taken. And then, last but not least, uh, the adoption of the of the next uh, uh, agenda and uh, venue and presidency for uh, the next UNEA, UNEA 6, uh, uh, which has been adopted and we'll hear from the next presidency, Morocco, uh, during the session about their ambition for uh, this moment. Next slide, I think is uh, summarizing uh, the ministerial declaration which was adopted by all member states uh, and uh, 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 puts forward that we need indeed to strengthen the action for nature to achieve the SDGs and uh, the need for transformative and systemic changes was once again recognized very strongly by uh, the UN Environment Assembly. So very strong uh, UNEA, I would say. And it was followed, I think the next slide, uh, well, that's on UNEA 6, but we'll hear indeed from, our, uh, uh, from the presidency in a moment. Uh, it will be in 2024, Morocco in the lead, and we are in very good hands there. Uh, but uh, it was uh, UNEA 5 was followed then by two days of celebration of UNEP at 50. We, we are 50 years old. It's a, it's a defining moment in the life. I'm nearly there as well. Uh, but uh, it was a moment where Member States came through leadership dialogue, looking back and looking forward uh, at uh, what we uh, have achieved, looking back in 50 years of existence, but looking forward as well on what we still need to do to tackle the triple planetary crisis for the people and for the planet, uh, because we're not doing that in an environmental vacuum. No, we are doing it indeed for uh, uh, the people uh, who are on our beautiful blue planet. And we had multi-stakeholder dialogues, we had a number of reports uh, that were uh, uh, launched, including uh, a very interesting report made by uh, uh, the stakeholders on the UNEP we want, which is, I think, a driver uh, and, and an ambitious one uh, uh, on what we are, as leaders in the environment, asked to do and deliver in the next uh, 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 50 years or so. Uh, the next slide. And we adopted a political declaration, uh, which was a compromise, again, in negotiation, but commemorated the 50th anniversary of uh, UNEP uh, establishment, but also looking forward at what we need to adopt. And I, you can find it, this declaration uh, which uh, is an easy read, uh, you can find it online. I'll go to the next slide, which I think was my last. Mm -hmm. uh, with this, in a bit more than 10 minutes, and I apologize for that, uh, I think we've been, we've been through the celebration of what we have achieved in this uh, unique conference. And with this, I would like now to uh, pass the word to the presidency of UNEA 5, which was Norway, and we've got with us uh, uh, the ambassador of Norway, uh, 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 Her Excellency, uh, your word is yours. I think you are online, so I'm looking at the screen far away from me, but I see you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to, to be here 
with you here today. Uh, it, it is really, it is really a positive. Uh, I think it's uh, it's really a day for celebration to to be able to to look into the results of uh, of Unia Five. So, so dear friends, and uh, good morning to to all of you, dear colleagues, excellencies. Um, I think it was already made very clear that the resumed session of the fifth United Nations Environmental Assembly that took place earlier this month indeed became a historic event. In Nairobi, the global community did come together to act on no less than the 14 resolutions and the two ministerial declarations that we were just introduced to. And we have agreed to start negotiations of an internationally legally binding instrument to end plastic pollution. And the goal is to complete the negotiations already by the end of 2024. The UN Secretary General stated that this is an historic decision and the most significant for the global environment since the Paris Agreement in 2015, no less. And this shows that UNIA can indeed act on the most pressing environmental issues of our time, even in a situation of geopolitical turmoil and conflict. We have agreed to work towards a science policy panel on chemicals, waste and pollution following the models of the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This will be a big step to address the third planetary crisis of pollution and ensure evidence-based policymaking. We have also agreed to a global definition of nature-based solutions for the first time in the United Nations. Nature can provide the solutions we need to solve environmental challenges. We must work with nature. And this important work will also continue. At UNEA, we saw a dynamic where good results in some areas inspired better results in other areas. But we would not have succeeded without the dedication and hard work in preparing the assembly that has taken place over the past three years by both civil society and state actors. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we have continued to keep up the pace to, to address the environmental challenges that the world is facing and to use the multilateral system. We were glad to agree ministerial declaration that brings together the ambitions in a holistic way. Now the challenge will be to make sure it is followed up, contributing to fulfilling the environmental dimension of sustainable development. The UNIA 5 declaration supports a broader understanding of the value of tackling the triple environmental crisis. It is also the road to delivering on the social and economic dimensions of the SDGs. Nature-based solutions will provide part of the solution to all three crises. The green industries we need for decarbonization, decarbonization, circularity, clean energy, and resource efficiency can simultaneously deliver on jobs and economic development. The best strategies will differ with region and country. The sharing of best practices and tangible solutions must be wide and inclusive. Let me also acknowledge all the work that has gone into agreeing the political declaration from the special session UNEP at 50. The process was very difficult, but it has provided a valuable opportunity to scrutinize and improve the terms of implementation of environmental commitments across all regions and also for strengthening UNEP. When we could finally meet in person, many issues had matured significantly. If anything, the dedication to multilateral results took an upwards turn faced with the threats to peaceful coexistence and cooperation that have emerged. The Geneva Environment Network has played a key role in these preparations, facilitating dialogue, information sharing, and building knowledge on many key issues. Informal and issue-based discussions like the Plastic Pollution Dialogue Series Jen has run here are important for increasing our knowledge and ripen our understanding of the issues at hand. A huge thanks, therefore, to the Geneva Environment 
network team and all other partners for all your efforts to bring people together and raise awareness of the challenges and of the possible solutions. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Morocco on their UNEA 6 presidency. Many important processes will have to advance and some also will have to reach conclusion under your watch as UNEA president. Norway will stand ready to continue our active engagement in these processes in the years to come. We will continue to work closely with our partners and build all the strong relationships that we have developed together. Together with Rwanda, Norway has launched a high ambition coalition to ensure we keep up our ambitions for the new instrument on plastic pollution. Through this initiative, we will seek to build a broad-based coalition with members spanning all regions of the world. The focus will be to deliver key messages before the INC meetings to drive ambition in the process, as well as work intersessionally at the technical level to develop knowledge products and facilitate discussions in key areas to inform decision making. In conclusion, looking back, I think we can repeat the theme for UNEA 5.2 and confidently say that we did act for nature. But as we all know, the work is far from over and we look forward to be part of the cooperation. I thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. And and you conclude wonderfully. The work is not over, indeed. And and I'm really glad that we could move so far, thanks to your presidency and to the efforts of Norway leading us in these three years. And I'm certain that with the next presidency as well, we will move further. And your legacy uh, will be the legacy of Norway uh, will be essential in 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 uh, continuing the process. Now. Uh, as we also look at contributions by member states uh, in Geneva, we get strong, very strong support from, from Switzerland at all time, and Switzerland is a very strong uh, partner of, of UNEP, and I'm very glad to have with us uh, uh, Ambassador Franz Perez, uh, who is going to give us from perspective from Switzerland on what we achieved in UNEA. Franz. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bruno, and also thank you to, to Diana and, and the whole Gen team for organizing once again, I think, a very, very timely and interesting uh, uh, Gen event. Indeed, in the lead up to, to UNIA, you're organizing a series of events, uh, and some of them, several of them focusing also on plastic. And as just said by Tina, I also think this has also been something that has been contributing to the, to the success of um, of UNEA 5.2. I would like just to address uh, three topics a little bit. First, some general points with regard to UNEA and this UNEA, and then I would like to highlight nevertheless some of the resolutions that, that are specific of interest for Switzerland, but also for Geneva, and then, of course, uh, make some conclusions for Geneva and for, for, uh, um, for, for the way forward. First, I think it is important always, always to understand what UNEA is. UNEA is it's the main body uh, of, of UNEP and, uh, and therefore also from the uh, UN system on focusing on the environment. And it has basically three functions to uh, provide scientific uh, information that is needed for sound policy making. Secondly, also to provide a policy guidance that is needed in order to uh, protect and, uh, our environment. And thirdly, also to catalyze action. So this is, uh, these are the core functions of UNEA, and I think this UNEA has clearly delivered on all of these, uh, of these functions. I think it is important also to be aware that, that uh, UNEA, we meet only every two years. In the past, on the old system, we met every year, but we meet only every two years. And that means that the burden of each UNEA is even bigger uh, and uh, because uh, because uh, the agenda doesn't get smaller by meeting, uh, meeting less uh, less frequently, on the contrary, it yeah, should make bigger steps uh, on the broad agenda uh, every two years. So the pressure of UNEA 5.2 was, was pretty big. In addition to that, I think we had all the still the, the COVID restriction, the preparation was more difficult than perhaps in other times, and there was big pressure before uh, the UNEA on member states uh, not to table too many uh, uh, resolutions. And Switzerland, we were pressed several times repeatedly to withdraw some of our uh, resolutions. I think we were one of the countries that has submitted most, uh, most resolutions. Uh, uh, basically, we were basically part of four resolutions, uh, and, and, and the pressure was tremendously. We always have resisted to that, because we say, well, UNEA, that's the, that's the moment where we come together, and we do, should not just weaken ambition uh, with regard to the UNIA and, and, and to the function of UNIA, 
But we have to make sure we have to organize UNAR in a manner they are able to deliver on that ambition and on, on, on that task. And I think looking back now, um, we can say, yes, UNEP was able to organize it in a manner that we are able to deliver on, on the broad agenda uh, in an ambitious manner. Uh, and that was one of the interesting elements. For me, it was the first hybrid meeting, uh, like, you, like the, the one in UNE. And to be honest, I think it worked. Many were, were nervous, but it worked. It really worked. We had a small team in place that was focusing on those resolutions that are the most important for us. And we had colleagues supporting them virtually or following the resolutions that were perhaps not as important for us as citizens. And all our partners had the same arrangement, and it did work well. I think that is an important horizontal lesson learned from, from this UNEA. Let me now just address um, four resolutions wh which have all been uh, supported by Switzerland uh, and go a little bit more into details, not make a thorough analysis, uh, and uh, not surprisingly, some are the same like you, you have just picked out. First, plastics. Plastic was one of the resolutions that Citizen was heavily engaged. We had a preparatory meeting uh, the year before uh, here in Geneva also at the WTO, organized together with many actors uh, where this coalition emerged that was submitting the draft uh, for, for uh, which was then negotiated in Nairobi. And it was obviously one of the big successes, uh, one of the most visible successes. It was interesting coming to Nairobi. It was clear we will deliver on that simply because the pressure was so big. The expectation was focusing on plastics, and uh, UNIA without the plastic resolution would then have perceived, been perceived as, as a failure. So we were able to agree on, 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 on launching negotiations for a legally binding incident, a big success, but it's worth to have a closer look a little bit at some elements of that resolution. First of all, uh, it's establishing an INC, we know that, for a legally binding uh, instrument on plastic pollution, including on the environment, uh, including um, on the, the marine pollution, uh, and that is also what was one of the topics that was was, uh, was disputed, or where we had differences in Nairobi. Should it be only on the marine pollution or on plastic uh, addressing the whole full life cycle of plastic? And we were able to agree on the broader scope plastics throughout their life cycle, and that's a very positive uh, uh, success. So it's a comprehensive approach. And then he was addressing the elements that this um, legally binding instrument should address. Um, objectives should be addressed. So that means you do not know what the objective is of the Convention. Interesting, we are launching a process, but you do not have an agreement on objective. And then some specific measures to promote sustainable production and consumption, including product design, waste management, resource efficiency, circular economy, uh, to promote uh, national and international cooperation. It should include provisions on developing NAPs, and so on. There are many uh, elements in that list. And there, one thing is very interesting, that many of these specific elements begin with promote, and others uh, say, you have to do that. And the only thing which is clear you have to do, that's the NAPs and the reporting. But whenever it comes to substance, the resolution says to promote. It's interesting, that distinction. And why is that interesting? Because it was clear, made clear in the, that the, this new legally binding instrument should contain legally binding and voluntary approaches. So uh, a conclusion could be by some that where we say promote, that will be voluntary, and there we have a a direct call for action that's uh, legally binding. Switzerland would not share that conclusion. Because how can you promote, for example, sustainable production and consumption uh, in the area of product design? I think only through voluntary measures that, that uh, will not be possible. And I'm saying, I'm highlighting that because we had a huge success by agreeing on, on that resolution. But some important elements we do not yet have agreement. The objective, what will be legally binding and what will not, not will be legally binding, just to mention two elements. So this negotiation process will not be easy one. And therefore, it's also interesting to look at the process that was decided. It was decided to have a first open-ended working group in the first half of this year, and then the first INC in the second half, and then conclude ideally by, uh, um, after five INCs in 2024. That is a very fast and rapid uh, process, and we expressed that in Nairobi also several times. We think at one uh, moment we have to uh, be aware that, that rapidity, speed, can be uh, at the cost of ambition. We um, think we should take our time to develop an ambitious and robust um, uh, legally binding instrument that includes legally binding uh, provisions. We had a discussion on that also with private sector uh, uh, participants who were calling for legally binding uh, standards and rules on plastics. And, and, and that will need time. And that needs, most importantly, good preparation. 
And then we sensed a little bit, not in the negotiation room, because I think their parties were pretty clear on how these things should be organized, but between parties, member states, and UNEP, perhaps. UNEP who thought, well, this preparatory meeting is small and easy and simple one, we can do it very soon in Nairobi, and then it's done and over, and all the member states who thought, oh, no, no, this, this preparatory will be, will be highly critical. This is not just something that can be quickly done. That needs preparation, and it needs the right people, and therefore it should not be done in Nairobi. And then we were really uh, uh, glad that Senegal has invited for that first meeting. Switzerland has uh, indicated they will finance, support that uh, first meeting with 300,000 uh, US dollars. We really hope that, that through that uh, willingness by Senegal to take the lead, uh, we will uh, contribute to, to good preparation of these negotiations so that we will also be very happy when this negotiation process comes to an end. Second decision I would like to, to focus on a little bit is the SPP. Um, Bruno has rightly said the science policy panel on chemicals, waste and pollution will fill a gap. We have one uh, such institution on climate change, one on biodiversity, and one now we will we decide to establish with regard to chemicals, waste and, and pollution. Interestingly, one of the big questions uh, was the scope of it. Should it be only chemicals and waste, as it was initially proposed by Switzerland, or should it be expanded to, to pollution? We found now a wording which uh, gives uh, space uh, to, to further clarification in, in, in the further process, of course, but it's clear it will be about chemicals, it will be about waste, and it will also be about uh, uh, pollution. And, and the process now that was established is to establish an open-ended working group, which should meet for the first time in 2022, which then really should define the scope, the structure, the function, and the process of this new science policy panel. Um, the functions, basic, the basic functions were agreed upon already. That's horizon scanning and identifying uh, issues of relevance first. Secondly, undertake specific assessments uh, and propose evidence-based uh, options on these specific assessments. Thirdly, to provide up-to-date information and identify gaps in scientific uh, uh, um, research. And finally, also facilitate information sharing. So we have more or less agreement on the scope uh, on the functions, but that still needs a lot of work. How can we really make the mechanics uh, of, this, uh, of these new institutions? Uh, so this process will begin, and the idea is to conclude, after, uh, to, to conclude this work after a maximum of four meetings in 2024, and then UNEP will organize a, a diplomatic international conference to establish that. So this SPP will be established by a diplomatic conference, uh, and it's, the idea is also, of course, that UNEP will be working closely together with the WHO, which is a very relevant actor in that area. So here again, we have launched a process, uh, a process that is perhaps uh, less uh, over-politicized like the negotiation of the Plastic Convention, but also that process will not be a very simple one, but we hope that it will be a very successful one. The third conclusion, uh, resolution I would like to, to look at, that is the one on chemicals and waste. And the reason, this is a horizontal resolution, and it didn't look so attractive and chassis like others. Uh, it was a little bit under the radar, but this is one of the resolutions we have tabled together always with, with, with other partners, because it is important that UNEP is not only looking at the new attractive fancy things, but it is also, we have also ensured that UNEP is continuing the ongoing work and chemicals and waste is one of the flagship area of UNEP's work, of course. And there it also needs regular guidance and motivation and support to continue its work. And that's the reason why this resolution was also very important from our perspective. Uh, it includes also some quite important elements. First of all, uh, to remind the, us of the importance of the post-2020 framework, the post-Psychim the uh, process, a process that has lost momentum now due to the COVID crisis and that has to rebuild a little bit in order to be able to deliver it. It also um, extended a special program to support developing countries in the area of chemical waste. That was an important decision that had to be taken. If you wouldn't have taken that decision, the program would have come to an end. And finally, it also uh, made clear that UNEP has to continue its work on issues of concern, looking specifically also on issues like endocrine pollutants and asbestos. That's also guidance that might start, see uh, at the first glance look not as chassis, but which is really important. And we think it is important that we take the tiny job also to look at this thing to make sure that you will continue this work. The last resolution on mineral resources. Um, that is also a resolution that Switzerland was submitting together uh, with partners. That is interesting how this resolution has evolved. We presented a resolution looking at the impact of mineral resource extractions. 
Uh, that was building on a, on, on a decision taken at Junior 4, building on a process that took place in Junior 4, but this process was basically regional meetings, but all were virtual. So it was interesting coming together in uh, Nairobi that not all partners were really of that virtual process. They might have participated, but it's not the same virtual meetings, virtual processes than in-person processes. And that's the reason why we were not really uh, able to build, as we were hoping to, on the work that has been done and to continue and deep and strengthen it, but at the same time also to make a little bit of a step backwards to catch up again to make sure that everybody will be part of that important process. Mineral resources is critical. This is one of the new issues emerging because the demand on mineral resources is increasing with the transformation towards the renewable energies and so on. And, and, and of course, extractions and the use and, and the disposal of these mineral resources has a tremendous impact. So we are able now to launch a process, again, with regional consultations, but also with a global intergovernmental meeting. I think that will be an important step to look not only at the extractions of mineral resources, but at the whole life cycle of mineral resources, and then looking at tools, best practices, standards and guidelines, environmental sustainable technologies, responsible business practices, opportunities to strengthen international cooperation in this area of mineral resource use throughout the life cycle. Again, I think that's a new area, and we hope also, of course, that that will deliver uh, important, uh, important uh, um, elements in order to help us to save the planet or protect the planet. Let me now conclude, sorry, I'm, I'm running out of time, make some general conclusions, which, are, why are we just presenting these resolutions also now here at this GEN event? That's because we think they all are highly relevant also for Geneva. Um, the plastic resolution, I think we have here a machinery uh, on the one side of, of, the, of the chemicals and waste cluster, who has a lot of expertise and competence to support such a process. We need a machinery to support the negotiations, who is competent, who knows how to do that, who has also that, uh, that experience. But here also in Geneva, we have many institutions that are highly relevant for it. WHO, um, 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 for example, many civil societies here, NGOs, and, 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 and also business uh, associations. But we have also um, uh, um, MEAs who are here. We have the WHO, all these institutions are in Geneva, which will be important to be engaged uh, in this negotiation to, to make sure that this, that this uh, uh, instrument will be a success. The same can be said about the science policy panel on, on chemicals. We do not only have the IPCC here, which serves as a model. Most importantly, we have all the uh, main actors in the chemicals and waste clusters here in Geneva and developing a new science policy plan without interaction and support of those uh, is, is just certainly not, not a good uh, way for, for, a seat, so, for success. So again, here we are uh, dependent uh, or, or need really a strong engagement of, of the Geneva cluster. And then also mineral resources. A lot of the work uh, in that area on, on the scientific work has been done through uh, Greek Geneva, for example, together with the university and, and the work done but also by the economic branch in, in, in Geneva. Also here again we have a lot of expertise and also a lot of expertise with emissions. We should not forget that. It's Geneva has also that benefit that Geneva can bring in both expertise and political perspective for the countries. So I think to conclude this UNEP was a tremendous success. It was a tremendous success, not by concluding work. Uh, as Tina said, the work is, is far from over, but by launching new processes and in order to make sure that these processes will be successful, we need a strong machinery, we need also a good cooperation with all the relevant actors, especially those here in Geneva, and most important, of course, we need also a strong and ambitious engagement by, by member states, because without the member states, we will not be able to deliver ambitions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Franz, and, and uh, for indeed underlining once again the ambition the agenda in front of us and the need to be all together in Geneva as member states, as stakeholders, uh, promoting this agenda, uh, moving it forward. Uh, uh, work is starting, basically. Work is starting, but, but we are all still really, really enthused and really conscious that uh, uh, the world is watching and, and Geneva is watching as well and working together to deliver these processes. Now, the work will also continue with UNEA, and we've got a new presidency, and it is really my pleasure to welcome Ambassador uh, Zniber, uh, the permanent representative of Morocco in Geneva, to join us uh, and provide uh, a few reflections on, on how Morocco uh, sees the process forward. Over to you, Excellency. 
Thank you so much, uh, dear Mr. Claude V, together with the, I mean, all the panelists, and uh, thank you, the, their excellencies, for their interventions. I would like uh, to thank you for the invitation for this debriefing and say, above all, uh, that uh, we are uh, very satisfied of the work done so far by the delegation of uh, Norway. A very important work as expressed this morning by you all. So we congratulate Norway for a very successful outcome of UNEA 5. Uh, just uh, probably some brief remarks on uh, the current context. I mean, uh, we are after the conference of Glasgow, which was uh, in a way considered as a relative successful uh, results from uh, the COP process, but also we are right after the uh, uh, publication of the last report of IPCC, which, are, which uh, was again a new clock of uh, a strong warning about the deterioration of uh, climate worldwide. I don't want to be pessimistic this morning because what has been said already by you all is very encouraging uh, when it comes to the outcome of NEA 5, and I will not, uh, I mean, uh, insist on these outcomes. But my duty this morning is just to give a short overview about uh, what Morocco can provide, uh, can come with as added value in its presidency of UNIA 6. Let me just Underline one important fact. We are the representative in this global, the most important global forum for environment in the world. We are also the representative of Africa. And we should keep this in mind because uh, challenges are the same for all of us, but challenges for Africa probably are more severe. So we have to keep this in mind in our view, it is important. Uh, we are drawing this kind of, uh, you know, remarks because we have an experience. We presided already some important uh, events, world events, particularly the two COP7 and 22. And then we, we know about that. And even we have uh, pushed for many processes within our continent, like the one concerning the three climate committees on Congo Basin, for example, on Sahel, on Iceland states and also other initiatives such as the agriculture adaptation in Africa and sustainability, stability and security in Africa in partnership with Senegal. Just to keep this in mind. But Morocco is also acting uh, here in Geneva very strongly. We were behind with other few delegations, particularly Costa Rica, behind the adoption for the first time ever of a resolution in the Human Rights Council recognizing uh, the right for a safe and durable environment as a right or of, as a human right, I mean. Uh, likewise, we are uh, implied within WTO on the important informal dialogue on plastic pollution and environmentally sustainable plastic trade. And it was for us the result, you know, uh, cut in Nairobi recently uh, launching uh, this process which will drive us to a diplomatic conference prohibiting uh, plastic pollution. It was really for us uh, a new in, uh, encouragement. And we have already in our agenda in the very few next week, something to do within the WTO with this new important, you know, push for us, impulse for us. So just, I wanted to present these elements because these are important as said by my predecessors, it means that we have also to work in strong coordination, hand in hand, with all those involved here in Geneva and elsewhere, and particularly in Geneva, because there are others who are very concerned about uh, uh, what is done by UNEP. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, not uh, not of a, <laughs> a negative uh, aspect, but I mean, who, who are uh, highly interested. But why, why why what is done by UNEP? and particularly for the next uh, two years before the UNEA 6. So dear colleagues, I don't want to come back to what has been said about the resolutions adopted uh, recently in Nairobi. We, we have this in mind as uh, Morocco and my Minister of Environment, uh, Her Excellency Mrs. Uh, uh, Leila Ben Ali, 
is fully aware of that and uh, we are uh, preparing ourselves i mean to exert this presidency uh, hopefully to the satisfaction of all but uh, we would like to uh, insist on some few elements of reflections already developing in rabat uh, taking stock of of course what have been said and achieved in EN, in efi First of all, to strengthen the environmental dimension of sustainable development. And this is pro probably one of, uh, you know, uh, the most direct line uh, we have to keep in mind if we have to achieve uh, the, the results for the humanity, for the population. So it is very important. And again, this work should be done uh, mainly with the stakeholders here, various stakeholders in, in Geneva and elsewhere. Uh, secondly, the, we keep in mind also the global environment and agenda, which is set, as you said, all of you again, of our multilateral environment agreements. An effort to take advantage of the synergies and integration between these agreements should continue to be carried out. The Moroccan presidency, therefore, intends to work to accelerate the pulling of efforts and the strengthening of synergy between the convention. In this regard, in this regard, and let me come back again to the COP process, we will spare no efforts to work with and support future COP27 and 28 presidencies to progress the historic commitments, uh, even being relative made at COP26. These uh, future COPs will take place also uh, in a, a, an environment, in a region which is strongly harmed by you know uh, the uh, climate change and environment environmental uh, i mean events so also this would be important probably for all of us uh, also to i know that of course unep is focused on uh, uh, as you said by the, the question of waste chemical waste by the environment i mean globally the question of plastic pollution but it does fall also uh, in uh, this debate we, we, we have, it is not only, you know, the, the heating of the climate, which is an important, uh, a major issue we have to deal with. I know that also the question of pollution, you, you uh, refer to WHO uh, many times this morning. Yes, indeed, we know the reports of WHO, very alarming and uh, really uh, more than alarming when we see the, the, the effect on pollution on the world population with the level of deaths and particularly among child. It is no more acceptable and we have to do all we can do, I mean, to reach our common uh, goals. I think that uh, Morocco delegation is also aware of the, the keys to success in multilateralism. We do believe in multilateralism. These keys lies in particular in the development of partnership. So our presidency will work on the consolidation of existing partnerships, so such as the UNEP Science Policy Platform, and in particular, the establishment of new ones with regard to emerging environmental challenges, benefit governments, the private sector, and civil society for an innovative solution to accelerate the achievement of its disease. We'll, we will hear later on from the civil society this morning. Finally, multilateral cooperation, as I said, and international solidarity are essential in a field such as that of environmental protection and sustainable development. The Moroccan presidency, believe me, will spare no effort to contribute to revitalizing international cooperation and solidarity in order to become, and again, the drivers of the desired change. Morocco, uh, uh, Probably uh, I can, of course, uh, just want to underline and stress very strongly uh, that uh, element, that factor, that major element. I mean, the head of state of Morocco, His Majesty King Mohammed VI, is personally involved in this process. I mean, and uh, he's, uh, you know, every day, every week, every year uh, behind the, the initiatives and uh, piloting himself. The, the, the programs in Morocco and also on a regional and more global level. So the, this presidency will be uh, held uh, with the most serious and the most important uh, involvement of, of the Moroccan state 
with a strong political will. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude and just uh, please uh, keep in mind that we are mobilized here as a Moroccan delegation in Geneva together with you. I mean, uh, periodically to be present whenever some initiatives coming from us or from other partners uh, have to be taken, we will be there and we will try to contribute at the best for our common endeavors and goals. I thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pozzi, and I thank also, I thank all the participants. I would have, unfortunately, to leave in a few minutes because I'm engaged in other matters, but my colleagues here uh, stand with you and the, in the debate uh, to come, if ever there are any question or remarks, uh, they, they, they will be so happy, I mean, uh, to answer. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ambassador, and, and really uh, glad that you could participate uh, and, and show uh, and explain what the priorities of uh, the Moroccan presidency of UNASICS will be. And, and, and you mentioned as well the importance of bringing them to Geneva. I often refer to Geneva as the capital of the SDGs. If, if we don't promote the environmental dimension and if we don't embed the environmental dimension of development in everything that we do in Geneva, we will miss the target. So with your help and support, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can we can move this agenda forward, very ambitious agenda here in Geneva. Thanks thanks a lot. You also mentioned the need to to be with stakeholders and to be driven by by what uh, 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 we are uh, um, what 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 civil society uh, brings to the debate, and I'm really glad to now pass the floor to uh, Patricia Heidegger, but also to Ingrid uh, uh, Rostat, who is with us in the room, to give us some perspective on what we achieved, but also, as I said, what what we still need to be done in the future. So uh, I think we'll start with Patricia. I've seen Patricia online briefly, and then Ingrid will compliment. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Prunapati. Um, excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this morning to you. Um, I'm a regional facilitator for major groups and stakeholders in the European region, and uh, I, I work with the European Environmental Bureau together with our colleagues from uh, Women Engaged for a Common Future. We have facilitated a series of international consultations for major groups and stakeholders to, towards UNEA 5 throughout last year and up to the Global Major Groups and Stakeholder Forum um, just before UNEA. So, um, let me say a few things regarding the outcomes of UNEA and a couple of points on the question of, of stakeholder engagement. So, on the outcomes of UNEA 5.2, um, just a few points from our analysis. Uh, we've been engaging uh, in this UNEA process with, with high expectations that UNEA 5.2 um, needs to see significant progress given that the triple planetary crises do not leave us uh, much time. So, um, before we talk about the successes, um, let me say that we were not fully satisfied with the ministerial declaration, which wasn't particularly strong. Um, we felt it was a shame that it did not refer to the human right to a clean, sustainable and healthy environment um, that has been mentioned this morning and it was recognized by the UN Human Rights Council last year. So, uh, we had hoped that the ministers of the environment meeting at UNEA would applaud this and integrate this. Um, we were also not fully satisfied um, by the political declaration for UNEP at 50, which we expected to be a, a strong follow-up um, on the resolution 73333. And we had hoped for a, a very clear commitment to strengthen international environmental governance in the coming years. So the declaration um, did not come up with uh, such a commitment with concrete plans. So, uh, we hope the opportunity has not been lost and we'll be able to, um, to get that commitment very soon. Now, looking at the success, um, of course, UNEA 5 did write history in agreeing on launching negotiations for the international plastic treaties. We really appreciate all the hard work that went into the adoption of the resolution. And we're very excited as civil society and major groups and stakeholders about the opportunity to, to develop um, probably one of the key MEAs of our times. So um, let's not forget uh, that civil society and the scientific community have played a very decisive role in pushing for that development. Let's also not forget that when we celebrate this achievement at the NAF 5, that the negotiations are only starting. 
and we hope to see your enthusiasm and your support to tackle one of the key environmental crises of our times throughout the negotiation process. We need to reduce global plastic production. We need to phase out the most harmful materials. We need to redesign products to avoid plastic waste in the first place. So this is going to be a long um, discussion. We also call on you to create uh, an, ena an enabling environment for major groups and stakeholders in the negotiation process, guided by transparency and a collaborative spirit. We also welcomed um, another, we found historic resolution on the nexus between animal welfare and the environment and sustainable development, dedicated action to protect animals and their welfare in the UN policy process has been insufficient to date uh, with devastating consequences for biodiversity, climate, pollution and global public health. So with the resolution, we believe uh, UNEA is providing um, the much le needed leadership to catalyze intergovernmental action for the environment. Um, some of you have already mentioned uh, the three resolutions to address the global crisis um, on chemical pollution and waste, um, which we all welcome. Um, the Independent Science Policy Panel on Chemical and Waste Pollution is key to support the implementation of the BRS and Minamata Conventions. Um, it's great to see that it values traditional women's and indigenous knowledge. The major groups and the stakeholders are all ready to engage in the panel. Uh, we do regret, however, that uh, there has been no coordinated global action taken on hazardous pesticides, which are a major, major concern, poisoning um, more than 300 million farmers and workers every year. We also welcome the progress on the sustainable nitrogen uh, resolution. Also here, uh, a missed opportunity uh, that the goal to halve nitrogen waste globally by 2030 was watered down um, in the negotiation. So a small step forward, but we need to uh, raise ambition. Now, uh, the Swiss ambassador has already mentioned uh, the resolution on, on mineral and metal resources. We were uh, dissatisfied to see that uh, not all member states uh, fully support the idea of global mineral resource governance. We believe, believe this is really um, a, a key area for future action. We are seeing a steep increase in mining activities. Um, this is creating increasing environmental conflict in all continents, um, not speaking about the severe environmental and health impact. So we do need stricter criteria for no-go areas for extractive industries. We need democratic control and transparency over resource extraction use. Um, so the major groups, um, we believe that it's been a missed opportunity not to set up an intergovernmental working group at this stage, but we're very happy and excited to actively engage in the foreseen regional consultations on mineral and metal resources and congratulate Switzerland on, on that step forward. So in conclusion, we do congratulate member states, UNEP and all participants on the adoption of many groundbreaking resolutions. The work will now begin to implement the resolutions adopted and we as major groups and stakeholders can build bridges between words and practice, monitoring action, um, and for that we need your continued trust and support. Regarding uh, stakeholder engagement, we believe that uh, major groups' participation in general was very positive at UNEA 5, 5.2. We'd like to thank uh, the outgoing Norwegian presidency and the UNEA 5 president personally for their strong support as well as the incoming Guinea 6 president, Minister Laila Benali from Morocco, whom we had the pleasure to already meet in person in Nairobi to discuss stakeholder engagement. Uh, we also welcome the, the very strong support by the presidency and UNEP uh, for youth engagement. This is key to ensure the younger generations take a seat at the table. At the same time, let's not forget that not all constituencies are equally represented. For example, only very few representatives um, of the indigenous communities were able to join us in person in Nairobi, even though they have more than 80% stewardship of nature and biodiversity globally. With the UNEP We Want report presented uh, by the major groups and stakeholders during UNEP at 50, we showed that stakeholder engagement through the major groups um, and stakeholders approach is not always uh, fully effective. Um, some of the needed reforms um, have been discussed uh, in the report. UNEA is uh, beginning to fulfill its potential as the main intergovernmental policymaking body and environment. And it's great to see the, the cro growing interest. Um, and that will also put more pressure on um, major groups and stakeholder processes to become more impactful, professional, and, and determined. So looking at UNEA 6, 
major groups and stakeholders uh, need to be engaged early on through the UNEA presidency and in all bodies and subsidiary organs of UNEA 6. We need more opportunities for all the nine major groups in various sessions and working groups. The space is always very limited, despite the vast array of constituencies and fields of expertise and world regions uh, that we bring to the table. As mentioned before, um, we also do need your support and transparency in the negotiations of the Plastics Treaty and the inclusion of representatives from um, all the nine major groups. So we're looking forward uh, to collaborating with you um, in the negotiations and towards NEA 6, and we thank you for your attention uh, this morning. Thank you for that uh, summary, Patricia. My name is uh, Ingrid Rusta. I am the co-facilitator of the NGO major group in UNEP, as well as co-chair of the major group's facilitating committee. I'm also employed in the Norwegian Forum for Environment and Development. So, uh, Patricia gave us a very good walkthrough of uh, our analysis of what happened at UNEA, so I will try to just draw some longer lines I think that it's very important to acknowledge the important role played by civil society as knowledge holders in many of the important environmental agreements we have. Uh, I know that uh, the negotiators um, have long agendas. Uh, civil society sometimes have only that one agenda point, and that is a resource for everyone involved. So that is one point I would like to really highlight here. We know, and that was very strongly um, uh, underlined by the presidents of UNEA 5 that the um, plastics treaty uh, process would not have had the result it did if it wasn't for the strong support of civil society actors and their knowledge in the area. And this is also why we are pushing for stronger, uh, stronger participation, not just delivering a statement at the end of the meeting when everyone just wants to go home and uh, or get their first meal of the day. So uh, this is one of the things we're really highlighting on a systemic level. We want to be part of a dialogue, not just delivering a statement. And this is also why we are, um, of course, everyone wants to speak more. That's, <laughs> that's uh, not some, anything new. But we are really seeking the understanding of more actors that as major groups and stakeholders, we have our unique perspectives, our unique capacity and competency. And when we are put in a situation where we are supposed to give joint statements across on all of the topics at once at the end of the meeting, um, it's not that interesting for anyone involved. So uh, looking uh, to UNEA 6, we are hoping to be able to have a strong, uh, more inclusive dialogue on how can the variations or perspectives be highlighted? How can the vast knowledge and important experiences from implementation on the ground, but also we have researchers who have dedicated their whole life to one specific topic in our uh, groups. So we have practical knowledge and academic knowledge and political knowledge that we just want to share, really. And uh, that's uh, one of our main experiences uh, after UNEA 5.2 is that we really, really wish we could take stronger part in dialogues with more um, individual mandates than as a joint speaking on behalf of everyone, because my message on how it is to be an indigenous person in uh, India is, of course, not very strong, seeing as I am a Norwegian not indigenous person. <laughs> so that's also something we really push for understanding of. And, um, um, and then, of course, we are looking forward to following up on the processes that have been initiated. We were very happy to see the science policy panel on chemicals. We have seen the very, very strong impact that both the IPCC but also the IPES uh, report has had on changing perspectives, changing analysis. We hope the same can happen for chemicals. And uh, lastly, um, it's going to be a very efficient negotiation round on plastics, but uh, we think we can do it. And uh, I just want to share a very small observation. Uh, in September, we were here in Geneva, just a few uh, meters down the road, and we were counting how many uh, member states would take the word legally binding in their mouth when talking about the plastic treaty. In UNEA, that was almost not even a discussion anymore. <laughs> And that's not that many months. 
it shows that if you work very uh, hard and constructively and really try to push policies, you can make a difference in a very short time, even in the big international negotiations. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ian Great, and thanks, Patricia, uh, for uh, not only um, reminding us of the uh, even more ambitious uh, 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 agenda that the civil society is promoting and that uh, uh, you would have liked to see reflected in uh, the ministerial declaration and the political declaration, but also for uh, uh, giving us at the end as well uh, the enthusiasm that we need, or that we all need, and, and, and this call for uh, us to to be as inclusive as possible uh, in in the negotiation processes with an S, because there are many ongoing. And, and I think this is a call that all member states are, have heard, and the Secretariat uh, as well uh, in UNEP, uh, we, we, we would like to uh, reflect that call and include it in, in the way we, we proceed with these processes, UNEA 6, but also all other processes. Now, synergies is a, a call, I could, could summarize this call by, by, by the word synergies, but there are also synergies with a number of uh, multilateral environmental agreements. Most of them are hosted here in Geneva, and one very important one is the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm uh, Convention, and I've got the pleasure to ask my friend Rolf Payet, who is the Executive Secretary of BRS, to to talk about these synergies that inevitably need to be there to get to success. Rolf, over to you. Thank you very much, Bruno, and I sincerely apologize to all colleagues, including France, for not being there physically. I think I'm one of the first victims of trying to move from virtual to physical. I was sitting there in front of my screen thinking that I was virtual, but actually I was supposed to be physical. And then by the time I run out uh, to go to the meeting, I forgot the mask, came back to get the mask because some places you have to wear the mask. And then I went to the wrong place. And then I said, no, that's enough. I will do hopefully the last virtual. But <laughs> seriously, it was like uh, gravy. But anyway, sorry for, for this. Um, um, as you know, the 14 resolutions adopted, I would like uh, perhaps to highlight, as everybody has highlighted, the two key resolutions, which are, of course, at most important to other work in the BRS Convention. And that is the establishment of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, or INC, for developing a new international legally binding agreement. And I like the word legally binding in there because, as you know, our conventions are also legally binding on plastic pollution. And of course, the decision to establish a SANS policy panel, or the SPP, to contribute further to the sound management of chemicals and waste and to prevent pollution. And as I was saying in a meeting yesterday, um, uh, without the three conventions coming together today, it would have been increasingly difficult even for member states to try and see how we can interface uh, with, uh, with such a, uh, uh, you know, such a fast-paced moving uh, incentives given by the member states in UNIA. So having one secretariat with the three conventions where we are dealing with the whole life cycle approach and where we are already synergized within the secretariat our work in terms of bringing together the different topics that are common to the three conventions, it would have been virtually an impossible task to, to really uh, support the work that uh, has been started now, an urgent work and a work that parties and member states have said has to be done in two years, which, uh, of course, that doesn't make it uh, as fun as some would have allowed to think when negotiating international con uh, conventions. And, of course, before I move on into the technical details or some of the proposals and uh, thinking that we have, I would like to, of course, congratulate and express my appreciation to all the member states. I was sitting there listening to them and, and seeing them work late into the night with one with one vision and one common vision, and that is to have this international agreement to address uh, uh, the issue of plastics. And for me, this is really a big sign of uh, international governance and, of course, a multilateral processes working in addressing such a global challenge. I also like to thank the, the NGOs, the civil society has they played an important role. Somehow, maybe it's invisible, but I think 
uh, we need to make this visible and to really recognize not only their role in UNIA, but also their role leading up to the whole decision and the different forums they organize, the different panels they organize. And of course, we'd like to thank them for in, including me in that whole process of engagement in, in, in reaching such a successful outcome of the union. I, of course, finally thank uh, UNEP Executive Director and, the leadership, and her leadership and also the staff of, of UNEP for really focusing and, and really coming out and supporting uh, member states in coming out with the negotiation. So for me, just uh, a few words of thanks. So, um, uh, of particular importance to us is, of course, uh, appreciating the member states' uh, realizations that we cannot all work in, in different vacuums or silos. And I think what was clear from the beginning of the negotiations throughout uh, the negotiations for both the INC and the FCT was the importance of first respecting the existing mandates of the MEA, the Multilateral Environment Agreement, Secondly, working and cooperating with them. And thirdly, benefiting from the immense experience that we have harnessed and gathered over the years in advancing international uh, governance on environmental issues. And I think those three core pillars will really demonstrate the way that the BRS Secretariat will interact and intervene uh, at those, uh, under those two uh, resolutions adopted by uh, UNIA 5.2. Now, if you have permit me, I will then uh, uh, share some views first on the INC and then secondly on the FCT. With regards to the INC, as you know, the Basel Convention adopted the Plastic Waste Amendment, which became effective on the 1st January 2021. In fact, we, we had our workload increase significantly, um, but uh, of course, with, with so much joy because it has really helped us to to engage in such an important global fight against plastics in a very concrete way. As you know, the Basel Convention is legally binding, so all the decisions of the Basel Convention are equally legally binding on parties. That said, we have rolled out a number of support for parties because, as you all know, we recognize that not all parties have the ability, the resources, and the capacity to be able to implement as such uh, uh, legally binding amendments and resolutions effectively. So we have a number of uh, initiatives that we are, uh, where we are running through, for example, our regional centers. We have 27 of them around the world, which support countries. We have a small uh, grant program, which is supporting, let me check my figures here, uh, in, in 33 countries. Uh, and also we have 100, we have the, the Plastic Waste Partnership today has uh, 23 pilot projects and these pilot projects will grow. And this is pilot project is not only with, with government, but with the private sector, with civil society, really looking at all the different facets of the plastic issue, as you probably realize it's quite a complex area. And uh, in, the, in the CWP, we have 114 members, which is, brings together in a unique way, um, uh, both uh, parties to the conventions, but also um, uh, the private sector and uh, non-governmental non organizations. So, so quite a lot is going on uh, with respect to the Basel uh, Convention work that we are doing. Um, uh, as you probably realize, we will not be stopping the work that we are doing. We are actually continuing the work that we're doing and 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 reinforcing it so that it can continue to support the ongoing negotiations for the new international treaty. We also have the Stockholm Convention, which aims, as you know, to protect human health and the environment from persistent organic pollutants. And uh, interestingly, a report just came out from the University of ETH in Switzerland, which found that there are at least 2,700 chemical additives which, are, which, have, uh, which are being used currently in different types of plastics. I'm sure there's more, but uh, let's carry on with the research work. But of those, a significant number us seem to, to be of concern to health, both human health and also the environment. So indeed, the work before us is significant as far as the Stockholm Convention is concerned in again addressing uh, the issue not only of additives, the issue of microplastics and other chemicals that are added to, to give plastics 
those resources, those sorry, not resources, those uh, those uh, functions and abilities. Um, uh, as you probably know, both the Basel Convention and the Stockholm Convention parties are very ambitious in their outcomes. They've been really moving forward. We've we've uh, facilitated negotiations both at the scientific level in terms of the Poprock, which is uh, the scientific body under the Stockholm Convention, but also under the Basel Convention to various expert working groups and the development of technical guidelines and other uh, and other forums that we organize. Um, uh, we are indeed making preparations to be able to actively engage in the INC process. We've already had a number of discussions with our colleagues in, in UNEP, and we're already outlining how we can support this process, both in terms of uh, process, uh, in terms of capacity, but also in terms of substantive contribution. We feel that this is the only way we will have a successful outcome of the negotiations because because we think that the expertise, the knowledge, experience, and the processes and lessons that we've learned over many years in implementing both uh, chemicals and waste conventions in a life cycle, cycle approach uh, will provide the INC with a springboard from which it can start its work and, of course, complete its work in the most uh, effective, inclusive, and uh, rapid manner. So, so in, in concrete terms, we are looking at contributing uh, our expertise on the life cycle approach. As you know, uh, member states were very clear that we cannot just deal with one part of the plastic issue. We have to deal with the whole life cycle. On the legally binding provisions, I think this is an important area where we need to explore with member states how and which components will be legally binding and how this will impact on the effectiveness. And this comes uh, to the next point, which is compliance mechanism and effectiveness and review mechanisms. I think it's important, and this has been echoed to me by many, many parties. New conventions that, that come up need to have inherent mechanisms for measuring the effectiveness because there's no point having a convention and the problem still uh, permeates and still continues to grow. So we need to be in a position to be able to measure the effectiveness of the decision and provisions of uh, such a treaty. And of course, most importantly, and finally, financial mechanisms. How we can leverage financing and support and capacity, especially for countries who are very much in need of financial support to be able to implement the provisions of uh, not only the new convention, but also the three conventions that I am responsible for. In terms of contributions in substance, uh, we are looking at contributing substantively uh, through our guidelines that we've developed, been developing over the years. We have a lot of expertise in developing of guidelines, both for industry and also for practitioners. We run a number of expert working groups. We currently have even a plastic waste working group on environmental sound management of waste. And also we have established partnerships, as I mentioned before, with international organizations, very strong partnerships with them which helps uh, in implementation, which helps in coordination, and also which helps in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in synergizing the decisions of, the, of our COPs with uh, their own uh, individual decisions of these international organizations. And finally, uh, as I mentioned before, the Plastic Waste Partnership is an innovative platform which we, we're hoping will also help to contribute to this whole process. Um, uh, in terms of the STP, um, uh, the, the science policy panel, uh, as you all know, so the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm conventions are science-based anyway as well. So the news of the setup of, of the STP is very much welcome. And as you know, in uh, 2015, the BRS COP took decisions with regards to this whole issue of science to policy in a decision call from science to action, recognizing the importance of the science policy interface for the effectiveness of the convention and stressing the need for science, uh, for scientific underpinning for decision making and policy making in the sound management of hazardous chemicals and waste. And finally, highlighting 
the need for great access to scientific understanding in developing countries to enhance informed decision making and implementation on convention. And as you will probably see from many of our expert working groups, we have very, very close collaborations with universities, both in the north and in the south. And uh, our strategy has always been to encourage the engagement of universities in the south, the investment in research uh, funding in the south, especially to help us understand the fate and, uh, and, uh, and uh, results of chemicals in the environment. Many of these chemicals are very complex. Um, uh, studies done in the north are not always applicable to, to, to situation in the south, which is a tropical environment, which is, uh, you know, different kinds of terrain, geography, geomorphology and everything, and, uh, and also environment, including habitats and biodiversity. So the reason is for us to see how we can strengthen the science, uh, to policy also in the south. And finally, we also have our global monitoring program under the Stockholm Convention, which measures POPs. And if you look at the whole map for monitoring stations around the world for POPs, you can see that it is highly concentrated in the north, with very, very few monitoring stations in the south. And this has always remained a concern of mine. And it's, it's, it's one of the issues that we need to tackle if we really, really want to see the science to policy action work because we really need to understand what's going on in the ground in the south as well as in the north. Now, a variety of science policy bodies support implementation and further development of the convention. For example, we have scientific considerations which are under mean, underpin, sorry, the determination of waste covered by the Basel Convention and also how to ensure all operations associated with the disposal and the protection of health environment is done and that equally applies to plastic as we have currently around the world a number of illegal dumping sites both in the ocean and on land and also poorly managed landfills which uh, allows those plastics to leak into the environment and of course we also have additives in those plastics which have the potential of contaminating both the soil the sea and the air um, there's a wealth of best practices and lessons to learn from experiences of science policy bodies established under the BRS Convention, and we will be very happy to share uh, our experiences in terms of membership, tools or procedure, conflict of interest, procedure, data confidentiality, and so on. Furthermore, as to the synergy decisions, the Secretary has a long experience in facilitating and enhanced interaction among the science policy bodies of the Convention, whether it is the the science policy body of Rotterdam and the science policy body of uh, the Stockholm Convention, and we've seen a number of we've had a number of examples where we've had this kind of synergies between uh, those two scientific processes. There are, of course, uh, significant gaps in. As I said, the, the the work ahead of us is is quite significant. I just wanted to lay out some of the points. So, so basically, um, uh, chemical releases and global pollution are wider significant gaps, and we're looking at the SPP of filling in that, 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 that hole. Yeah, the second one is on economic gap. This has been an issue raised by many parties, is how they make the transition from, uh, one particular chemical to another, or one particular process or industry to another. There's also the issue of risk to human health. How do we quantify this? How do we measure, measure this at the global level? And of course, finally, the issue of alternatives and how we work with industry to ensure that there are adequate alternatives, green alternatives that can be used to replace especially those chemicals that have been uh, banned. And finally, in my last 15 seconds, it is important as well that the FCP explores the link with climate change and biodiversity, such as the work of IPCC and the work of IDBE. And in IPCC, for example, there's a lot of landfill emissions which uh, causes climate change. Then we need to explore links. And it, it based, as you know, chemicals, uh, pop chemicals accumulate in wildlife, for example, and it's important to provide a link there. I will stop here, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Bruno. Uh, I have so much to just provide to the panel today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rolf, and, and, and apologies that I had to uh, come in, but indeed there's a wealth of, of substance, of contribution, and of best practices that we can have from uh, the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions and and 
I think this is what really is important to, to bring into this debate. Uh, we will have to work together uh, with the MEAs, with uh, the civil society, with the private sector uh, uh, to deliver the ambition that we have on all uh, these uh, decisions that were taken at uh, UNEA 5.2. Now, we've run out, uh, nearly, uh, we've nearly run out of time, but I really want to uh, quickly open the floor in the room if there are questions that we will address very quickly. I see, yes, Eve. Well, first of all, thank you for, for this, uh, all of this presentation and, and for the discussion on UNEA. Uh, there was one thing which hasn't been said about the, uh, the outcome of UNEA, which was a bit of a, of a contrast, because indeed there, is very, there are very strong uh, outcomes on, I would say, the expertise field, and that well, has been very well described. But we, we remain still a bit disappointed with what was already mentioned as being the 50 years. I mean, 50 years after Stockholm, uh, we definitely have to stay stuck. Where are we? And I don't think as a global community we can be very proud of where we are in terms of environmental outcomes. And uh, the problem we, we feel is that these discussions seems to be a bit behind what is needed to look at uh, when we're thinking about Stockholm plus 50. And uh, saying this, uh, this contract between this general dialogue and expertise um, is an issue that we find also here in, in, in Geneva because once when you get to the expertise, things are going forward, we do see, and this is, has been very well said, but then we are stuck in, in silos. And I wanted to pick up on what the ambassador from Morocco has said about the outcome, uh, the recent outcome about the, uh, the resolution on the right to a healthy and sustainable environment. Because it is really striking since this has been adopted, how much it has mobilized. Because for so many people outside in the field, it's so obvious that it should have been adopted since so long, why is it coming only now? So I was wondering here if the groups like Switzerland, Morocco, uh, the Maldives and those who are behind this are thinking of using it also as a mobilizing tool. And that could perhaps be a help to try to overcome some of the silos we, we see when we're talking about the expertise. Because so many other, you know, in the scientific field, in the, in the um, non-governmental organization are ready to get involved. And with that, you have a tool where you can see that you participate in a bigger endeavor than just the only small field where you are working on and when you have this specialization. And I was wondering if this also, as Ambassador Perez, you were mentioning about the role of the International Geneva, this was not something that could be used here at, uh, at a more local level. Thank you. I think we won't have time to collect many questions, but I think the question is, is, is a nice way as well to to bring not only an answer, but a conclusion uh, from each participant uh, as, uh, uh, as it puts forward, again, the ambition, the need for more ambition. And as we're gearing towards uh, Stockholm Plus 50 and other conferences, I pass first to Franz, then we'll go to Ingrid uh, and Rolf, and I'll conclude. Over to you. Thanks a lot, and thanks for the question. You were touching many, many very important topics. Starting with Stockholm Plus 50, that is a process that is uh, not yet concluded, and, and we certainly share any disappointment about that process. We would have expected something uh, significantly more robust to, 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 uh, to um, use that birthday, not only to celebrate and looking backwards, but also to, to launch uh, further process forward. But that's, uh, we are where we are with the decisions from the new General Assembly, so not much can be done there. Um, I think uh, I agree with you. We have to overcome silos. That's also one of the reasons why Switzerland is putting uh, synergies high on its agenda. We are really pushing everywhere for synergies uh, for different reasons. Uh, uh, also because the synergies certainly increases effectiveness in them, impact uh, and effic efficiency. So we are really we are fully on board on that. And I think it's you're right that uh, taking uh, looking at these issues perhaps through different lenses, like the human rights lenses, can also be uh, a way forward to to further uh, strengthen and, and move ahead. So that is certainly also an important approach where Switzerland is, is active in it. But at the same time, of course, that cannot replace the very um, specific work on biodiversity now, which is just across the street, on chemical waste, on, on climate change. So that cannot be replacing that, but only stimulating and, 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 and pushing that. Thanks a lot. Thank you for raising that question. And uh, um, 
from the major groups and stakeholders, we are, to be very frank, very disappointed in the process around Stockholm Plus 50. We are mobilizing uh, our engagement and um, competency, and we are really seeing that there will be a lot of uh, dialogue in the meaning of um, statements following statements. So that is really all I can say at this moment. We are hoping to see more progress. Um, to focus on the other elements, um, I would like to just draw the comparison between um, when you turn a round year, as we say. Uh, you know the 30-year crisis, the 40-year crisis. Uh, a lot of people, when they see the zero behind their age again, they, um, they make significant changes. Suddenly you want to cut your hair or buy a motorcycle. And uh, perhaps that is something to consider for uh, UNEP also. Not necessarily buy a motorcycle, but uh, uh, to really take stock of your life. What in, um, just like I encourage everyone to just take stock of their life and see what makes me happy. Uh, UNEP should uh, take stock of um, their life and see what is working and what is not, and how can we become uh, more efficient, uh, more uh, in contact with ourselves and uh, uh, ideals, the uh, values that lay in the heart of UNEP. So really just, and maybe Stockholm can be our chance to take stock uh, and really uh, analyze where are we at, what needs to happen now, and then we can get that midlife crisis we are all longing for. That will be my final words. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ingrid. And I like the idea of a midlife crisis, uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. I see. Sorry, I still see. I, I didn't know that you were still online, uh, 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 Morocco. The yes, sorry. Sorry, sorry, apologies. sorry, Mr. Dwar Victor. Sorry, I have a problem with connection. I couldn't uh, just, uh, if you allow me one minute to conclude, because my ambassador. Of course, of course. That. Just uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, also for uh, the comments made by ambassadors and colleagues. And I just want to say that uh, the, the success of UNIA 5 uh, take us to a new era of working. The work just began for us now, and it is imperative for us uh, to work together on translating the resolutions into concrete actions, starting with those related to plastic solutions, chemical products and waste, believing that the solutions advocated must be felt by the citizens of the world as the right to a sustainable environment. Morocco is determined to spare no efforts and work with all of you, with all stakeholders here in Geneva and all over the world in order to consolidate the authority of UNIA as an, institu an, an institution sitting the global environmental agenda. Thank you, Mr. Pudi, and thank you all of you. Thanks a lot, and all together we will we will do it. So uh, uh, all united, we will stand. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll conclude also bringing my small reflection as uh, UNEP, but also on a personal level. And I think uh, basically we it is a glass half full of the glass half empty. And I'll start with the half empty because uh, yes, ambition is driving us. And at the end of the day, the product that multilateralism is bringing uh, is, is always below the ambition. It is the process. It is what it is. Uh, uh, it is difficult to negotiate in the multilateral uh, uh, world and to get to results. Uh, and, and, and this glass, which is half empty, uh, we must be ambitious to fill it to the top of the, of the glass, even with drops falling on the side of the glass, please. So, so keep pushing us, keep uh, 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 driving this ambition. And this is what stakeholders and what here in Geneva we need to do, linking it, uh, this silo in the, 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 the environmental work, bringing it into the human rights sphere, bringing it into the trade sphere, bringing it into the health sphere, because that's the only way we will, we will achieve the high ambition. Now, I'll turn it around and see the glass are full still. Uh, because we've achieved magnificent results at UNEA. And, and of course, we are in a bubble. We, we still, environmental bubble, and we tend to say, okay, it could have been better. But look, we did it despite one of the highest political tension that the world has witnessed in the last 60 years. 
and this was not self-evident, and this could have derailed everything. But the high ambition, the, the conscience that negotiators, stakeholders, and participants to UNEA had, that we were facing a higher ambition than the political crisis, that what is at stake is really to solve the triple predator crisis. That's what drove us, and that's what brought success to UNEA. And this is this ambition that will keep driving us. In SOCOM Plus 50, we will put seeds about what needs to be the next 50 years, and it will drive us on the way to UNEA 6 and in the processes of negotiations that we're starting now with the INC and the science policy uh, uh, panel. So thanks a lot on these positive words. I want to really thank you for being in the room, for being online, and uh, thank the panelists uh, who have contributed to this debrief. Thanks to the GEN team, the Geneva Environment Network team, who's been working really hard behind the scene. Uh, it's not the only event that they organize this week. They've got a, a host of events uh, every week, and, and it's really hard work for them, so they really deserve uh, our thanks and uh, a small applause. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thanks. We would like to thank all the attendees that were that are now leaving, but were with us online. As mentioned in the chat, I'm also mentioning that for who is in the room, the summary, the video of the event, uh, the documents that were presented, and then the links to the resolutions and other documents are available on the web page of the event, which was the web page announcing uh, this event and will be shared by email again. Thank you.